welcome everybody to another Vita Learning Webinar. I hope everyone is doing well out in the, the world. Uh, things are heating up, cooking up, you know, getting better all around, hopefully. And I hope that's true in your area as well. Today, we're fortunate enough to have um, Mr. Peter Peasy uh, give us a webinar, a new topic. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? What's up, Tim? How are you? Good, good. So today's uh, topic is understanding the envelope of function concept, which Peter is going to go over with us and explain to us uh, how that works. And before we get going, there's a couple uh, points I'd like to bring forth to everyone. Uh, your phone is on mute. So if you try to speak, you're not, we're not going to hear you. There is a question box on that right hand side of the panel. So go ahead and use that question box. Type in your questions. Uh, if it's something that's uh, pertinent that we should interrupt uh, Peter, I will do that. But otherwise, uh, your questions will mostly be answered at the end of the webinar. So please give us your questions. We're always happy. We like that at the end of the program there. We have a lot of questions uh, that Peter can follow up with. Uh, so please do that. The other thing is, is that uh, people ask, will it be recorded? Yes, the webinars are recorded and they're found on our Vita North America YouTube channel. Uh, so please visit that website. You will also have an opportunity to visit all of the webinars we're doing, we did last year with Peter and also the ones that we've done in the last month and month and a half of 2022. And then we have others as well. So we're, we have a great 2022 lined up with uh, Peter. We're also going to be doing some um, remote workshops as well until we can get back into the field. Uh, if you ask for a CE, the CE will be through the registration that you uh, submitted to join us here on this webinar. So we'll talk about that uh, later on in the in the presentation. So today we got Peter, Mr. Peter Peasy. Uh, he's a worldwide dental educator for technicians, dentists, and auxiliaries, pretty much any anyone. Uh, well versed in multiple of subject matter. Uh, he's a CDT and MDT, um, and explain to everyone what a FNGS is. Uh, isn't that TIGS? Thank God it's Friday. I thought it was, wasn't that? Uh, FNGS uh, fellow of the Northeast and Nathological Society. So I think um, it was a fellowship and a group that was very important to me and still is. It's a great group. It was based here on the East Coast and it's basically a group that focused on occlusal concepts. So I, I think where I started really came from occlusal concepts and, and then I evolved into ceramics and everything else. Yeah, and the reason why I bring it up is because it kind of ties up, ties up to the understanding, you know, the subject matter today, because a lot of us never get to uh, further our education in the sense to get any formal education. We look at what's in front of our, um, you know, eyes, and that's about it. And it's uh, difficult for many of us to get out and further educate, get some discipline on, uh, on these concepts. So it's really fantastic that you're going to work with this subject matter today. Uh, Peter. Uh, Peter is the owner and manager of PZ Dental Studio located in Staten Island, New York. Um, I think he recently moved from uh, New Jersey from last week, I think, or a couple weeks ago. Inside joke, yeah. sorry. Uh, Peter has a personal appreciation and expertise on all phases of clinical, laboratory, traditional, digital techniques, color communication, and digital photography. As I mentioned, he's he's well-founded, well-based, education-driven for any subject matter. He's a board member of the Association of Master Dental Technicians, a teacher, an educator in Master Dental as in Dental Master Dental Technician Program, at New York University. He's a member of the American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry, fellow of the NGS Northeastern Nathological Society. Editor in Chief of Inside Dental Technology, Executive Board Member of the NGS, NGS, and then a faculty at NYU School of Dentistry, and ACP Technician of the Year in 2018. So, with that, 
I am going to introduce you, Peter, to as being the presenter, and we will get going. So you are now the presenter, and the board is all yours. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to open up my program here. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate um, the the long, long introduction. I guess. <laughs> thank you. You know, it is interesting. I thought I better. I thought I better get yeah. it right this time. <laughs> no, you did. But it's funny sitting here listening to all those things get read over and over again every week or every lecture. It's kind of weird. But anyway, um, I, I think you did bring up a good point, right? So the, the Northeastern Naphthological Society, which I, I've been a member of for a long time, it's really where my education started across the board. It, it was in these areas. And, and I think some of the first education I ever did was in um, NYU in the master's program here in New York. Uh, and then I went on to Dawson and Panky and, and, and Coyce and, and the evolution of occlusal concepts over the years. So for me, um, everything we do is really based occlusally. And I think uh, I've hopefully evolved and I hope we, we keep evolving as a profession and how we see this. And I'll try to touch on that a little bit today. Um, it's a topic that I'm kind of excited to talk about. At the same time, you know, I need maybe seven days to really go through this the way I'd like to. So I'm going to try to stay as focused as I can on the actual envelope itself. Um, and to do that, it's going to have to mean I'm going to maybe shift through a few things a little quicker than others or, or might lose one or two of you along the way. I hope not. So I'll try to keep that real as I can. But when I talk about the, the occlusal envelope or function, it's really important to me. Um, I'm here in my office today in New York. So for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm in my little office. So you might hear some noise behind me now and then. Um, this is where I spend 12 hours a day. I was here till midnight last night in case you can't see it in my eyes at this point. Um, and constantly trying to keep up with the flow of work and, and, and relearning things and re-educating ourselves. And as Jim said, yes, I'm also the uh, editor-in-chief of Inside Dental Technology, which I, I really hope you all read my editorials and, and go through the magazine as often as you can. I'm really trying to make that as um, useful and, and education-friendly as it can be for all of us in our profession. So it's really important to me um, that you're all getting the opportunity to see that. So let's talk about the occlusal envelope of function. So I think the goal here is when we talk about this, there's an aesthetic component and a functional component. Um, aesthetically is what drives most of us, it drives, it's what drives most of our patients. Sometimes we get patients who come in for functional challenges. They have pain, they have discomfort, teeth are breaking, teeth are wearing. So they actually are aware of their functional component. But let's be honest, 90% of the time, most patients are coming in for an aesthetic fix. They don't like the way they look or, the, or their wife or husband told them they need to fix something. And it's kind of a ever evolving process. So I'm going to try to skip through the aesthetic component here and really stay involved in the functional. To do that, I need to make sure that we're all on the same page and the understanding of what we're working with. We work in the somatic naptic system and this system is the entire complex that makes up the functionality of how we eat. Part of it is breathing today and the chewing processes and, and the aesthetic processes. There's an entire system, and it's actually the most complex system in the body. It's really, it's truly an amazing process if you really start to dive into it. As great as every body function that we have is, this one might be truly the most amazing because of its ability to adapt and its ability to um, intercept the, the perception of what's happening around it consistently. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that. When you look at the system, it's, it's comprised of the basics. We have teeth that we're all aware of, but we also have muscles that move those teeth up and down and allow them to do what we need to do. And all of that is braced in the joint, which is this little area you see right here, the TMJ. And that joint is actually what's the housing or the support for that jaw to move. And this process is important because there is no other body part that works that way. The, the, the respiratory system or your knee joint, no matter what it is, they all have amazing ability to them. None of them have the ability that we have here. First off, let me explain what I mean by that. The stomatic system actually works in proprioception. Now, for those of you who don't 
know what that means. Best example I could think of, and it's an example that we've used for years, is most of our feelings work off neuron response or nerve response. So the best example is you put your hand over a flame, the flame starts warming up your hand, that signal gets sent to the brain, and it tells you that that's getting warmer and hotter. At some point, you're gonna pull your hand away from the flame. Sometimes you may burn yourself a little first, sometimes you may not, depending on the movement and the speed of the situation. Teeth do not work that way. They don't actually have a, a neuron receptor or they don't actually send signals that way. They actually send them slightly different. They actually send the, this response through a, a chemical or a fluid-based system that allows us to actually have a much quicker response time. And the best example of that is, have you ever put a piece of tin foil in your mouth by accident? Maybe you were eating a, a sandwich and there was a little piece of foil in it. And the second you bite on it, Think of the response that happens in your brain of you can't do that and how awkward it feels. And that's kind of a different process than burning your hand or feeling the pain of a cut or, or something else that happens. So that proprioceptive response is really critical. The reason it's so critical is because of the force that these muscles can apply. So the master muscles, the lateral pterygoid, the temporalis muscles, these are all our occlusal muscles that provide force when we bite into chewing boluses of food. It's been measured at up to about a thousand pounds. I think actually the, the most recent measure was a thousand fifty, if I'm not mistaken. But I think the average human hover, hovers around nine hundred to a thousand pound of force. That means that when you bite down, you're capable of a thousand pounds of pressure. And if you realize how amazing that is in this small little environment, you also realize how much damage you can do if the teeth are not in the position they belong in or if there is something that causes them to not act the way the system is supposed to act. So for me, this little proprioceptive response becomes critical for us because that's what's saving us most of the time is the instantaneous reaction. Now, the best way I've always described this over the years is M&Ms, right? Why an M&M? Well, let's think about it for a second. You take an M&M, you put it into your mouth. What's on the outside of an M&M? A hard shell. How does your body know, how does the brain know how much force you need to break through that hard shell? It's instantaneous for you, isn't it? But here's where it gets tricky. What happens after it breaks through the shell? What's underneath it? Soft chocolate. And yet your brain knows not to bite as hard because if it was biting with the same pressure that it bit to break the shell, then by the time it got to the chocolate, you would probably break or damage the teeth. So it's an instantaneous pressure-based system that starts to be able to read it quicker than anything else our body is capable of. And if you think that M&M explains that well, well then I'll, I'll make it harder for you and say, what about a peanut M&M, <laughs> right? I love this one because same thing. My teeth have to break through this hard outer shell, yet then it hits something very soft and it has to know to not put as much pressure Although microns later, it hits something very hard and it has to put even more pressure. So how can when we chew these, we don't break our teeth constantly because of the proprioceptive response system. And that's why it's such an amazing process of, of how we work through what we're, we're dealing with every day, working with restorations and different materials. Let me do another thing before we go too far into this and define what we consider occlusion. And I want you all to be aware of that these terms are constantly changing. Uh, the ones you're looking at on the screen right now are, are the Glossary of Prosthodontics 8th edition. Uh, I believe we're close to the 10th, if I'm not mistaken, at this point. Um, or maybe that was sidelined a little with, with the COVID years. But um, basically, I'm going to throw some terms out there. And as I'm throwing them out there, I want you to know what they mean. So MIP is one that you should know and probably hear quite often. What that means is the most maximum intercuspal position. All that MIP really means is when I take two arches of cast models or a patient who closes their teeth together and all their teeth are predominantly touching, that is their maximum intercuspal position. And that is where 90% of us work every day, both on our cases and in our real life when we bite and chew food, MIP position. Then we have centric relation. Centric relation is a long definition here and I won't read it all for you. I'll give you the, the basics of it. It basically has more to do with the condylar position in the fossa. 
And by the way, it has nothing to do with teeth. And that's where it kind of gets a little confusing for people. It's a relationship between the condyle housing and the condyle itself. It has nothing to do with the tooth position. And then the last one would be the centric occlusion, which is a combination of when the teeth are closed and the joint is in its housing. So let me kind of define these for you very simply. Maximum intercuspation is a tooth term. We're talking about how the teeth come together. Centribulation is a bone term. We're talking about how the bone sits into the fossa. And then centric occlusion is a combination of how the teeth and the bone position work together. So in an ideal world, and this is why I say it's a little wishy-washy because these terms keep evolving. I think today some people call it centric related occlusion. So that's when we have the bone in the right position and the teeth in the right position. But I think they've also tried to get away from that term a little bit because it, it could lead you down a path of thinking that um, there is an idealism to the centric related position or an idealism to the tooth position. And there is not. It really has a lot more to do with us individually, which is why we have to work our way through these occlusal concepts, concepts better. The other thing to be aware of is even though that we talk about the lower jaw moving, um, it doesn't only move, it also has a flexual rate to it. So that means every time a patient opens wide and the condyles are braced in their fossa, um, the jaw actually starts to flex and it changes the position of the jaw. You're going to find that this is the reason that most of the time um, when you're getting tight contacts or, or higher or low occlusions, this has a lot to do, a lot more to do with the flexual rate of the lower jaw than it has to do with anything else, although provisionalization and uh, and tooth management is part of the challenge there, but realistically, I want us to be aware that the flexual rate of the jaw does have an effect. Um, the example I've used over the years is a simple one. We all hate triple trays, right? Nobody wants to use a triple tray. Oh, they're so bad, they're not accurate, they're this. You're right, 90% of the time, except sometimes on lower second molars, if I have to put a full arch tray in the patient's mouth, they have to open much wider in order for me to get the tray in the patient's mouth, that wider opening changes the angulations of the teeth because of the flexural rate of the jaw. So maybe not better to use a full arch tray on the lower arch impression sometimes. Not, notwithstanding though, there are challenges to the triple tray world. So basic occlusal concepts are what? We want to understand where the teeth belong in the face and we want the harmony to be acceptable that when a patient bites and closes, they, they feel like they're in the right spot, the teeth look the right way, and they're not breaking or damaging. What I always like to call the occlusal concepts are really functional insurance for us. The goal is we don't want our restorations breaking, although I could also make the argument that if something is going to break, I would much rather it was a restorative than it was the actual tooth below it or the implant that's been permanently braced into the bone. So to me, the restorative failure should still be in the restorative materials, but at the same time, I don't want them breaking willy-nilly, especially after we've just done a full mouth rehab uh, on a patient. We want to make sure that we protected them the best we could. So in the old school world, we talked about the posterior teeth support or protect the anterior teeth because of their stops, and the anterior teeth protect the posterior teeth through anterior guidance. And I don't want to say that's not necessarily true. It is true, but I think we, we can make a lot of different arguments for the value of anterior guidance and, and when it really exists and it doesn't today. And um, I would probably start to hedge more on the side that it's not as important as we think it is, although it doesn't mean I don't try to incorporate it on every case that I work through. Just the challenges is in the oral environment, people don't function the way we think they do exactly on the articulator. So the goal is really, instead of thinking about it from the older school concept, I'd like to put a newer concept in. And the newer concept is really, of course, I want the posterior teeth to protect the anterior teeth through their occlusal stops, but I want that to be a bilaterally balanced posterior teeth. I want it to be that when our patient closes down, they're hitting evenly on both sides of the arch. And that is really the protective, the protective mechanism for them. If they hit harder on one side, then we have the shift and slide. And that's where it starts to cause challenges, not only for the posterior teeth, but for the anterior teeth. And then rather than talking about um, anterior guidance, I'm gonna talk about the non-interfering envelope of function, which is kind of our focus for today. Now, for those of you who don't really understand what the envelope is, let me break it down this way. 
when you close in a general um, CR, CO, MIP position, when all those positions coincide the way they're supposed to, what you tend to see in the posterior teeth are what we call dots and lines, and the posterior dots and the posterior lines in the anterior. And this is kind of an old school concept that if you're closing right and your tooth teeth are all in the right position, you should really see two, three, one dot per posterior tooth, depending on the type of occlusional scheme you have, class one, class two, or class three. When you start to make movements to the left and right or protrusive, you should start to see fairly straight lines forming on the anterior teeth. And this is kind of the, the simplicity on an articulator that we work through. If I don't see that on my articulator or even in the oral environment, I start to see smudges or heavier marks, well then I'm not really having a bilaterally balanced occlusion. I'm hitting harder in some areas than, than other areas. And those areas can now make the anterior lines start to be a little erratic and put more pressure on the anterior teeth, which is exactly what I don't want to do. So I want to make sure that I'm really clear on my instrument, that I've transferred my information well, and I can really work my way through those dots and lines on the instrument. Um, I will also just throw out there that about 30% of most of the doctor's times today that we work with are spent adjusting restorations that we do. And to me, that's really problematic. Um, part of that could be their challenge. Part of it could be their provisionalization, um, not managing the occlusion or not understanding the position of the teeth. But also part of that can be our challenge of not really understanding how to work through the articulation process and manage the movement of the teeth. So I think it's a, a twofold process here for us that we have to really be aware of. So for me, uh, even if I'm working on a quadrant model, I really want to try to watch all the movements and not just use the articulator as my only example, especially if I'm not using the right articulators. Today, most of us work with these little plastic contraptions here. Um, I always jokingly, jokingly call them model holders and not really articulators, as these are not really articulators either. These are just two things that hold the models together that kind of give you a basic concept of how the teeth close together but it's not really very accurate. And the reason it's not accurate, and this is a slide that I did probably, oh, about 10 years ago when I started teaching a closure course, this is I actually mounted a little clip trap articulator um, onto the models, and then I remounted the models onto a real semi-adjustable articulator. And the reason I did that was because I wanted you to realize the difference of what we call the arc of closure. And what happens is, is this is my center of rotation. So when I close these two models down together, my posterior teeth hit in a certain path or a certain angle. And when I'm checking that with paper, I get an idea that, okay, it's hitting hard here, but I need to adjust that or change that. The challenge is it's not real. It's actually not even close to real. And the reason that is, is because when that restoration is placed in the patient's mouth, the arc of closure now changes because the rotational center is much further away from the teeth than the actual teeth that we're working on on our little articulator. So in truth, what am I really saying to you? A semi-adjustable articulator is much more of an important tool for us. Should we be using semi-adjustable articulators on single molar restorations with triple trays? Of course not, it's not gonna happen. But what you do need to be aware of is how to make movements in those models to emulate what you see in nature. And those are by the layer facets, um, how the bite actually locks in. And sometimes it's even a little common sense, right? I, I can't tell you how many times I'm working on a case and I, and I built what I thought was an attractive looking molar. Uh, and then I look at the adjacent tooth and my molar looks like it's three millimeters higher. Well, how can that be? How can that patient function on that? And I have to kind of go back and reevaluate the movement of the cast to realize that although I want to make it look proper as a molar, I have to really make it fit into the environment that I'm in. So the best example of this, again, is this arc of closure. Here is a molar that I made years ago, and you see that I have it on a little tiny articulator, and you can see that when I open and close the articulator, I'm gonna get a mark where I think it belongs. Problem is when I move that to the oral environment, that mark is gonna shift, and now your doctor's gonna spend a lot more time adjusting and grinding and ruining the anatomy that we put in. So that's posterior. Now let's move to the envelope, which is really our focus for today. Um, <clears throat> for me, I have to be honest and tell you that I sat in, in, in Florida in the Dawson courses for a lot of years. And um, when I would see these pictures on the screen, I think they always confused me. I didn't really get what was happening. So 
please forgive me if I'm too basic in this, but I want to make sure we're all on the exact same page. When I talk about the envelope of movement or the envelope of function, what I'm really talking about is this lower incisal edge position and the movements it can make behind the linguals of our anterior teeth. And this movement is a, it's a lot more than we probably realize. So if you follow this big border movement, this is the blue that you see here, this means that I could take my lower incisal, I can actually move my jaw so far out that I can come past the incisal edge or up and around it. And then if I yawn really big and really wide, I can actually bring this really far down and I can start to come back up. So this is the entire movement that that lower incisal edge is able to make based on the lower jaws movement up and down. Where do we really work functionally? We work in this little bit smaller area here, this green area that you see here. And this is what we call our functional envelope or our functional movement of where we normally work through. So that's what it looks like from a sagittal view when I'm looking at it from a cutoff section sagittally. If I'm looking at it from the facial point of view, so now I take the front of the teeth and I'm gonna make those same movements, Again, the border movement is a lot larger to where the jaw can move itself to. But where it functions is a much smaller area of actually chewing and reading and talking and all the things that we do. So it's a much smaller movement. And I would be honest and tell you that I think for me, one of the biggest culprits of, of occlusal issues comes from this. It comes from not understanding the envelope of function where we work. So let me be clear that there's a lot of different envelopes that we could talk about. There's the normal envelope, a dysfunctional envelope, a constricted envelope, and today there are some new terms where we have a frictional envelope and they're kind of evolving and, and harnessing this concept more and more over the years, especially at the Koi Center, which I'm a, I'm a mentor in and, um, and, and teach there and proud to be part of. So um, this, this concept is evolving more and more over the years. I'm going to really stay focused on the constricted envelope today. And the reason for that is because I want to make it clear that all of these can have crossover. So what do I mean by that? You can have a normal envelope where you have normal class one bite, you chew normally, you have no wear for sets, nothing is damaging, breaking or chipping, you have no muscle fatigue, everything seems to work fairly normal for you. And then maybe at some point one tooth break breaks or chips or Maybe you have some restorative put in, a new bridge in the posterior or an implant, implant place. And now all of a sudden that normal envelope that you're so used to chewing in has changed. You now have to adapt that. And when you make that adaption, a few things could happen. One, you could become more dysfunctional in the envelope, meaning you're not sure how to get to the same position because there are things that get in its way. Or it could be that you become more constricted. And what happens then is the anterior teeth tend to go more forward and hit against the linguals of the upper teeth a little bit quicker. And the reason I wanted to focus on the constricted one is because, like I said, both of these could overlap, right? Dysfunctional envelope could become constricted, constricted could become dysfunctional. But in the end, I'm going to say that the one that does the most damage and the one that I like us to be most aware of is the constriction. So what is a constricted envelope and how do you know when you're working in one? There are obvious signs. When you look at the patient or you look at the cast of the patient, you're gonna notice a few things right away. One, when I see aggressive wear on the lower incisal edges or on the lingual of the anterior teeth, some notching and some wear, this is usually a sign of a constricted envelope. Uh, also, if I just put my two casts together, like you see here down in the bottom corner of your screen, and you can see how tight those teeth are touching, that is a sign of something is constricted. That means the teeth are hitting too hard together behind the, the linguals of the incisal. Uh, and, and I have to be honest and say that I see this very often in restorative. So we're restoring the patient's full mouth, or the anterior teeth, upper or lower. And what tends to happen is we're building the teeth, the patients back into a constricted envelope. We're not giving them the freedom that they need to have behind those upper incisal edges. And in truth, what tends to happen is if we're working in restorative materials, we're gonna get a lot more wear against natural teeth a lot quicker, or we're gonna start looking towards using harder and stronger materials to protect the restoration, but not protect the oral environment. So for me, what I wanna make sure we're understanding is how do we know which is which? When do we know how to treat these processes? And how do we learn to read what we're seeing in the restorative 
cases that we're working on every day. So here's a perfect example, and I'll, I know you guys can't all answer me, but uh, I'll answer the questions for you. And I would say, what do you see when you look at these two different cases? How do you restore these? These patients come in for aesthetic challenges, functional challenges, and your job as the technician or the, or the clinical dentist at this point is to figure out how we restore this. And I'd like to be honest and tell you that there's not one way, right? Not each of them is a simple scenario because every case has its own challenges. And our job is to figure out what do we use restorative wise and how do we manage this materials to make sure they last and they look aesthetic and they do all the things that we want them to do. And you do that by learning to look. Would I manage this case with the same way I would manage this one or the same way I would manage this one? No, because each of them have different issues. Some of them might have chemical components, which we'll talk about in a second. Some might be strictly functional and OBD related, and some of them might be either perio involved or orthodontically involved. And we have to be able to know the differences between each of them. So in a case like this is kind of a great example if a case like this presents itself to you, is it really just a functional issue? Has the patient done all that damage just by the way they chew? It's possible, but it also could be something else. It could be a chemical component in it. And it's something that we don't really talk enough about. It's kind of the chicken and the egg, egg concept, right? Which one comes first? Is it a functional problem or a chemical problem or is it both? Uh, and sometimes it is. And I wanted to kind of address that with you just briefly so you start to see that as you look through your cases. So yes, of course, this is a functional issue. The patient's wearing through their teeth. And by the way, this patient's young. I think the patient's like 30 years old, right? So there's lots of damage here that you can see happening. But is the damage only functional? And if you start to look at the teeth and you say, well, you know something? There's gotta be something else happening here because look at all the, the, the wear of enamel, look at some of the little pitting you see in some of these areas, and look at how much more aggressive it is on some areas other than other areas. And part of that becomes what we call chemical wear. Again, I don't wanna be, I'm, I'm being wishy-washy on which one came first, because in truth, either of them could be the first component. We don't always know that until we work our way through the case and understand the patient history. But I do want you to know the difference. I want you to know the difference that when you look at a case and you say, well, this is a functional component 100%, but there was also a secondary chemical component in here. And I could tell that by how these wear areas are a little bit more smooth, a little bit more rounded on some of the edges. When it's strictly wear, you tend to get a much sharper, flatter surface. When you start to see some of the rounding and pitting, you know there was a secondary chemical component in there, which also could also could be first sometimes. It could be chemical that causes the functional wear, but most of the time in a case like this, it looks the opposite. It looks like we had a functional wear and then a chemical component kicked in. And when I say chemical <clears throat> component, I'm just talking about acid erosions and chemicals that we're eating every day. Uh, sodas that have high PhDs or, or or foods that we're putting in that normally the enamel would protect the tooth and now it's becoming more of it can't protect it because it's not there anymore and now those chemicals are starting to eat away at the dentin which is causing that secondary component so what is our options well let's talk about how we can manage our way through this and where the envelope actually comes in so look at a case like this, this is a case i did probably about 10 years ago now i think um, maybe even longer and what i treat it differently today maybe I'll tell you that um, the way we treated these two implant crowns that were placed, I, I might think differently today of how I did it, but uh, not so important for, for the purpose of today. So you can see the person, the patient has what we would call a um, dysfunctional or constricted envelope, right? They have a lot of wear happening in the posterior, in the posterior teeth, but they also have a ton of wear happening in the anterior teeth. So when this patient is biting down, they're doing lots of damage to their teeth. And our job actually becomes is, how do we manage it? What's the right thing to do? First scenario for me is occlusal. How do I manage the occlusal? Well, option number one is usually orthodontics. Can we orthodontically move the teeth into a better position to prevent the patient from wearing through them as quickly as they are? So orthodontics is kind of the first option for me. Sometimes it's even orthognathic. Is the bony architecture in the wrong position? Are the jaws in the wrong position? That's what's causing 
uh, of a challenge, or is it a tooth in the wrong position? Second option is changing the occlusal vertical dimension. How much opening should the patient have, or how much did they lose based on what they've worn through their teeth at? So I might think that the simple fix for this is really just changing the occlusal vertical, the occlusal vertical dimension for the OBD. And either one of those is fine, right? I could orthodontically intrude the teeth, I can extrude teeth, or I could move teeth. Those are really some great options with orthodontics, although each of them has their challenges. Intrusion sometimes can be more difficult, extrusion can be more difficult depending on the bone density, or the simple widening or moving of teeth can sometimes be more challenging. So it's not always an option. And I would just throw in there that when I'm talking orthognathic, that is an option that's more prevalent today and more people are having orthodontic surgeries, but I'd only make the, the additive to it that even if I'm using, if, even if I'm doing this in an orthognathic movement, changing the position of the jaws, 95% of the time, I still need an orthodontic solution in there. Because when I move the jaw position, I'm not necessarily, fi necessarily fixing the tooth position. So I want you to be really aware of that whenever I'm in the orthodontic world, I'm almost always in the orthodontic world. So rather than go to the orthodontic, sometimes it's better off just to stay in the orthodontic position and moving the teeth where we like. And then lastly is changing the vertical dimension. Maybe I could just open the arch a little bit. And I think the question that arises when I say that is, well, how much can you open it? Uh, there are some theories that you shouldn't open it more than three or four millimeters. And there are other theories that you could push it four millimeters or five, sometimes depending on um, the patient's angulation of the eminentia uh, and how the housing and how the condyle sits in that housing. What I would tell you is, if, as long as you stay in that normal one to three ratio, changing vertical is not an issue at all. Matter of fact, I'm very comfortable by open vertical and probably 70, 80% of my cases here in the laboratory, and sometimes we need it for space to manage the restoration position rather than only orthodontically moving the teeth. And the reason that I tell you that one to three ratio is so good is because of what I just showed you with the molar restoration. You see, if I open the anterior teeth three millimeters, because of the radial distance of the condyle that you see way up here, I'm actually only opening the posterior teeth about one millimeter. And that one millimeter is virtually nothing. So could I open the anterior more than three millimeters? I could, but realize that the ratio changes as I get closer to the rotational center. So a three millimeter anterior opening based on the radial distance of the condyle is technically only about a one millimeter opening in the posterior, which means if I open the anterior four, how much am I really opening the posterior? one point something, right? 1.3 or 1.4, whatever that works out to mathematically. It's not a huge opening, even though it seems so huge in the anterior. So I have no issue changing the occlusal vertical dimension on patients. And in some cases, that's the only way to fix them is, is by changing the vertical dimension. On other cases, you can actually see it in the patient's face. Sometimes when you look at a patient and they close, you can see how the teeth come together and, and the the, the strain that's happening across the, the lip dynamic where they're actually all over closing and that face looks a little squarer. So in those cases, changing the vertical dimension is really a great thing. But the warning there is that as I'm working my way through these cases, I could argue that not every patient who has the teeth all worn down and, and tons of wear that you see across the arch has actually lost their vertical dimension or needs a vertical opening dimension. Sometimes what actually happens is as the teeth are wearing, as you see here on the lower posterior teeth, the other teeth start to erupt into the position on their own over a long period of time. So in a case like this, and this is really a great example, which is why I put this case in here, could I not do orthodontics and still restore these teeth? Possibly, but would it work ideally? Because think about it, in order for me to open this patient's vertical, Think about how much teeth I would have to prep here or have my, my clinical partner prep and how much crown lengthening I would have to do to start being able to get the tooth, tooth back in a normal position. And by the way, on these posterior teeth, I really can't crown lengthen that much because of the, the root formation. I have furcations in the roots and I won't be able to bring the gum line up that far. I'd be prepping away a lot of the tooth and changing the, the, the 
width to, to length ratio. So realistically, the only option here is for us to intrude these patients' teeth and restoratively open the vertical dimension is where we can actually do both. So I'm going to want to push these teeth up with occlusion, with, uh, with um, orthodontics. I'm going to transfer this information with a face bow. Uh, today, I don't really use these types of face bows anymore. We're using a horizontal plane reference or a Kois analyzer. But the concept is really the same. And really what the concept is, is I'm maxillary space to the instrument that I'm working on. I want to make sure I'm transferring this information to the instrument that I'm working on so I have the aesthetic and functional parameters. And then I'm going to take bite records. Another cool thing that's happening today is this is becoming really digital for us. And this is really interesting to me. I don't know how well implemented this is yet, but as we get into the digital world and we're starting to use more of this digital technology, we can actually start to use some of the digital technology in our skin. So I'll give you an example of how that works. So what we're actually doing here <clears throat> is scanning. This is our, our digital face bow. They use those little measurement tools that you saw from the RMEAS to actually scan the position based on the distance from the occlusal table to the scan flag on the top of the face bow. And now what you notice is they're attaching upper and lower plates. And they're using this, again, measurement from the distance. So as the patient starts to move, watch what happens. We can actually measure the movement of the patient. I think this is really great information for us to start to see, right? The more movements that we make, the more details we can see in the three-dimensional world. It really starts to help us to kind of understand the occlusal concept. So for me, I think the technology is evolving so much that it's it's going to get better and better for us as time goes on. Again, this is an old case, probably like about 10 years old. Like I said it's a mostly implant single units or cornea case that I did a long time ago. Uh, and I wanted just to show the final concept of it is where we ended. And like I said, we intruded these posterior teeth and then restored them to a new OBD. And what was the goal here? Well, the goal was what I said to you before, bilaterally balanced posterior teeth, which is what I wanted, and then creating the right envelope for the patient so that when they smile and chew that they're not putting the damage or their functional, um, or my functional concern on the anterior teeth. I'm giving them that little bit of freedom behind the envelope so they can actually work in that area comfortably across the arch. And every case is different. So a case like this with this particular patient, Again, I want to understand where the inside of the leg belongs, but you could also see some of the super eruption that has happened. As the patient has worn through the posterior teeth, they did get some um, growth or, or, or tooth movement that has come down, but they also have the opposite effect where the anterior teeth are kind of extruding out of the arch. What would be ideal? Put them back orthodontically. Will every patient do orthodontics? No. So we have other options here, and because we still have a good amount of tooth structure left, some of the options might just be simple crown lengthening and a little bit more of an aggressive preparation. And that's what we wound up doing with this particular patient. So again, full mouth rehab, we're trying to move the tissue and the tooth structure where we want, but then we're restoring it to the proper envelope through the, through the OVD opening or the occlusal vertical dimension opening. So what I really want to happen is in the end is when this patient bites down, that he has the freedom to work behind the restorations and has the support of the posterior teeth uh, that he's protecting the envelope from, from uh, too much stress. So I wanna make sure that I've had bilaterally balanced posterior teeth and then a clearance in that envelope for them to work through. And let me be clear when I say what that clearance is, it's not inches, it's microns, right? It's just enough freedom that when the patient closes that we can maybe shim stop through or pull a little, um, uh, material of you know 10 20 microns through that the patient isn't hitting hard in those areas and that's how we're protecting the teeth across the board so same concept for us over and over again that i'm always watching the envelope and by the way it's not only just about the restorative or the vertical opening 
sometimes for me, the orthodontics is really the biggest key, right? So if you look at a patient like this that I just happened to uh, pop on to last night when I was looking through some old photos, this is a case that needed some serious orthodontics. And then after the serious orthodontics, what did we do? We restored a new cacuzzo vertical dimension. First, we put the teeth in the right position, and then we restored the teeth to the proper aesthetic look and, and, and harmony that they really wanted to have and that we wanted them to have, and that we can now protect our restorations through that. So the other last thing that I'll touch on before I go into the last case is this one word that we don't use enough, and that's called home. And what home is is, is kind of the, the, the newer occlusal concepts that we kind of skip through. And what I mean by home is the position that each of us have, that when we close our mouth, something touches, and that might be the tip of a cuspid, it might be the first bicuspid, um, it might be a molar somewhere that touches. Whatever that spot is, it sends a signal to your brain, that sensory signal that we talked about from a fluid position, that tells us we are home. And once we have that, it allows us to actually close into the position that we're most comfortable in. So I've actually borrowed these slides from the Coit Center years ago. because I think they have the best example of what we're trying to show here. This patient closes and bites down. What you're going to notice that their first point of contact might be this simple uh, secondary cusp on the molar here, or maybe it's the bicuspid. I'm not sure which it is. But one of those two things actually touch and close. And if I was to take a bite at this point and, and I restored this lower tooth here, what would I tend to want to do? I would want to bring the occlusal up into that lower, that upper opposing tooth. And then I would make this pretty lower second bicuspid. I'd send it back to the doctor. They would put it in the patient's mouth and the patient would bite down and say, no, it's too high. It doesn't feel right. And the reason that they would say that is because their first point of contact wasn't their last point of contact. Once they made that point, look what happens as they start to squeeze down or close into their full point of contact. They've actually changed the position of how their jaw locks in. Part of that could be the periodontal ligament. Part of that could actually be just a little slide in movement. So if we work without understanding the home position of the teeth, that's why we get restorations back that the doctor has ground the entire occlusal scheme down and sent it back to us and said, please glaze and finish. It's perfect now. And we're like, but... I don't understand. It doesn't touch anywhere on the model because the model is didactic, right? It doesn't have the ability to have the movements that the patient has. And that's why I think where we get lost sometimes on these triple tray or small impressions is not being able to read the home position and how important it is for us to understand that if we don't just follow the home, we have to follow the actual occlusal scheme of how the patient bites into their opposing teeth that's where our restorations become high. So home for me is kind of the key point. And again, you can see that more working through the articulator systems. Um, one of the things that we do a lot in the laboratory is when we're trying to evaluate the occlusal uh, scheme, we're using the, the provisional cast to do that. And sometimes we're gonna make putty matrices of the provisional class, cast because we can actually get a better understanding of where the teeth belong when they're prepped. And the reason for this is because is when the teeth are prepped, the patient has now lost their home position. They don't have the same tooth that touches anymore. So when the doctor asks them to bite down, they don't know where to stop. Home is gone. They have no way to get into the position that they used to. So rather than counting on the doctors to always be able to take that bite, which is a very difficult one for them, sometimes what we actually do is we'll mount the study cast first, we'll make this putty matrix of the palate, and then we'll mount the prepped cast to that. The good news is, is if the doctor's bite lines up with the putty matrix, we're a home run. If it doesn't, I feel more comfortable that this is more accurate. Why? Because the patient didn't know where they belong. They don't know what to bite into anymore, but the provisional gave us the reference of where they should and shouldn't be biting. So again, I'm gonna make that aesthetic transfer for the position on the articulator, and then I'm gonna use the provisional as my bite reference or the doctor's bite reference to mount. Um, I did mention the face bow before, and I want to be clear that the older school face bows still work in this angulation problem because they're using the ERS their reference, and that changes the angulation of the cast on the articulator, which is what we don't want. It's not the way patients really function. It's not the true angle of a patient's arch 90% of the time. 
what you really see in a patient's arch is a much flatter plane. And this is why using the facial analyzers or Kois analyzer is a much better practice for us today because it gives us a better reference in the plane, but it also helps us with the envelope. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. You see what happens here is when the angle of the arch changes, well, I've changed the angle of the anterior teeth. I've made them look longer, but I've also changed their angulation. And now when I'm working my posterior teeth, that angulation is not proper anymore. I want my angulation of the anterior teeth to be very um, similar or exact to what I would see in the patient's mouth so I can work from behind it the right way without that angulation change. Think about it from a common sense point of view. If I tilt the teeth in, now I have to tilt the lower jaw to kind of fit it, but I don't know if it's accurate anymore because the angulation has changed based on the radial distance of where my condyle is. Also, if I've mounted this the right way, it gives me something else that's really important. It gives me an understanding of where the plane is. So I don't wanna make sure that I, I, I constrict the patient. So to do that, I wanna make sure I understand where the incisal edge position belongs. So this is a great case to kind of walk through this and we'll finish off with this one to kind of put this all together. This is Ricky. Um, I did Ricky's case again, probably another eight, 10 years ago, if not longer. Um, and you'll notice lots of challenges here with Ricky. You'll notice that um, the plane is canted. So that's a problem for us. Um, aesthetically, I don't know if you guys catch, but there's a little bit of a, a deviation or a collapse in his face, which probably says to me right away that he's probably missing some bone in this area because it's not supporting like the other side of his face as well. So that's gonna be a little bit of a challenge for us. And as I start to go a little deeper into the case, you'll also notice some of the telltale signs of what I would call constricted envelopes. So what is that? Well, the posterior teeth don't really have much wear except for this wear facet that you see on the, uh, on the opposite side, although that wear facet was done by the restoring doctor as they were adjusting in the occlusion. But what is also happening here is look at the amount of wear that's happening behind the anterior teeth and look at how thin you can see metal exposed here. You can almost tell right away that this is where the patient is closing into. So part of the challenge is they did not manage the envelope. Was that because the lower teeth needed to be moved? Maybe orthodontics was an option. If the patient wasn't going to have the, the orthodontics and the other option was to what? to manage the occlusal vertical dimension more in the posterior teeth. And that's what we're gonna do in this particular case. So my goal is, is to get him away from the point where the lower teeth are hitting hard into the anterior linguals and give him a little bit more freedom behind that envelope. And you can see it's happening over and over again, right? Look at how many little spaces here. It almost looks like this case broke or was soldered a few times, who knows what's going on here, but you can see the limited space. So the call here is that there is just not enough occlusal space to manage this to get the lower teeth away. And partly, again, the lower teeth can be moved orthodontically, so that's an option. Although in today's world, I would have to understand the breathing capabilities of the patient. I don't want to move the lower teeth back if the tongue is thrusting it forward or if the patient has limited breathing, meaning that they're snorers or mouth breathers and they don't really breathe through their nose worst thing we could do is move those lower teeth back and give them less space for their tongue to have which causes more breathing constriction so we don't want to do that so in this case the opening of the vertical is the right way the way we did that is by using what we call a deprogrammer you can see this plastic piece that's in the patient's mouth and there's a stop here that the lower teeth will hit into and this stop is going to help to give me a new vertical dimension position. That's going to give me the bite reference. And I'm going to use a horizontal transfer to transfer the facial position or the, or the maxillary position onto the instrument. So we'll do that with our facial analyzer. What we receive in the lab is nothing more than this little plastic um, face bow transfer. I could put that on a table and now I can mount the maxillary arch to the instrument, which is fabulous for me. I can also utilize that information to verify what I see in the patient's photo, meaning that I'm using the horizontal reference of the table and I should be able to see that I get the same cant on the articulator that I see in the patient's face. I also mentioned to you that I'll use the bites, but I'm also going to make my own palatal index to verify because I know when this patient loses their first point of contact, they are not going to feel very comfortable. So what's important to me 
that I'm using full arch impressions and I'm actually being uh, capturing a lot of the palatal information when I do that because that palette's going to be the thing that helps me the most to make that transfer from a, a study cast to a working cast. So now we'll take a look at our patient. You're going to notice all the things that I just talked about and you'll notice that I'm looking at the table and I'm looking at the plane. There's a little chip on the model. I'm sorry about that, but I think you can actually see that it's very similar both in the patient's face and on the articulator. Um, I already talked to you about digital, so I won't go there for time. I also mentioned from an aesthetic point of view, uh, I could see that the patient was deficient in some of the bony architecture. So this is going to be a combination white and pink case for me. And I'm going to send that information back to the doctor to try him. Uh, you'll notice that as he's trying it in the patient's mouth, um, we still felt like there was a little bit of, of not enough support here. So rather than redo the wax up, I just actually added the doctor to ask the doctor to add a little uh, acrylic there. So they put some pink acrylic on to try to get a little bit more support. This way we understand how much support we're going to need for the facial support. And you can see it's a little bit better here. Not perfect, but probably about the best we're going to do. After that, we'll do all the normal things that we would normally do. A bistake try-in, a frame try-in, start evaluating the color of the paint. But the goal here is, is the most important thing is I want to make sure I've opened the vertical dimension enough to give myself the envelope freedom here and not reconstrict him. So in the end, I'll finish up the case. We'll place this in the patient's mouth. And the vertical dimension has changed because now the envelope is free for the patient to function behind these incisal edges without chipping, breaking, and wearing through them. As it starts to heal up, you can see our, our pink ceramic and the patient's pink start to kind of blend a little bit better as the patient gets hydrated and all comes back together. And I think Ricky wound up being a fairly happy camper. I've showed this case a bunch of times over the years, but it fits so well when we talk about the constricted envelope cases. So um, I know that's a lot of information to throw at you, but uh, I'll stop here and we'll open it up to some questions. The goal and the function of this was really just for you to start to see that as we look at cases, I want you to look at them a little bit differently and understand that you have options orthodontic vertical dimension openings and understanding that what we don't want to do is create tougher envelopes or frictional tight envelopes with our restorative materials otherwise we're going to do more damage to the materials and more damage to the actual patient so with that said i'll stop here i think we're just about ooh, right on time again jim perfect so i'll stop here um, and i'll let you take back over and hopefully we'll have some questions out there i told you it's a tough topic to talk about right and to break it down into something specific but um i hope i, I hope you the point was clear for everybody to understand the importance of understanding the functional envelope that we work through that was that was perfect peter no it, it was great and i think we have a lot of uh questions here so before we uh get going real quick uh ce you'll get this ce um through the education marketing department so through your registration information uh, the workshop, uh, this webinar has been uh, recorded. You can find that on our Vita North America YouTube channel. And then uh, you can also, while you're there on the website, is look at, review other webinars that we've done, as well as uh, future webinars. We've got a lot to, uh, uh, to do to videotape for the rest of the year. If you want to reach us at the help desk here at Vita North America, please do, do so using that information on the screen. Uh, we also have uh, encourage you to contact your local representative as well. And then, of course, um, along with Peter, we're doing many, many, many more uh, webinars. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, even remote, like a three-day uh, workshop in lieu of a hands-on in the field and uh, in person uh, we're trying to do a couple workshops online with Peter which will be fantastic and then uh, here's the information for Peter so let's uh, look at some of the questions we have uh, so can you Recommend a particular semi-adjustable articular uh, articulator that you like, or recommend books or publications that have more information about your um, function. 
I, I, honestly, I'm a fan of a lot of them out there. I, I think the AD2 one is great and it's really compatible with a lot of other systems. So my friend Dave Williams owns that company. I like the Artex. I think it's a great instrument. I like the Stratus from, from uh, Ivo. So there's a lot of good instruments out there. Um, the good news about the instruments is most all good high-end articulators are made with the same Bonwell concepts of design. So they all have very similar measurements and very similar movements. Uh, I don't think you need to go to anything so advanced that's fully adjustable, they become really expensive. And there's a lot of arguments that we can make that the fully adjustables are just kind of silly at this point, especially with all the information we know and, and the parameters. But um, almost any good semi-adjustable articulator uh, works well. In the lab, we tend to use most of the Panadents and the AD2s, um, although I, two cases came in today that are on Stratus and some doctors only work on a SAM or, or, or an R or Artex. So we have them all and we're comfortable working on all of them, um, whichever you, you're comfortable with or your doctors are comfortable with. The only thing I'd throw in there, I'm sorry it's a long answer to your question, but the only thing I would throw in there is I've been down the path over the years, especially when I first got into occlusion, occlusion, that I would get my doctor to buy the best face bow. So let's say I take an Artex face bow and that's $2,000. And then I'd get them to buy the Artex articulator at $2,000. And then they would take a bite transfer and send it to me and it would be off. And I'd have to say, well, it's no good. So this is all wasted time uh, and it's not working the same way. What I've change to over the years is I really want most of my clinicians working with a horizontal plane reference. That's the Coix analyzer and that's either through Panadent or AD2. And that now is transferable to any articulator that you have. Um, AD2 makes all the different tables. So if you have Panadent, Artex, SAM or, or, or um, Stratus, you can use that same Facebook on all of them. Uh, and I think that's a much smarter direction to go because it's a cheaper investment for your, your doctor partner. Those face blows are two, $300 as compared to 2000. And you can use them on whatever articulator you're now comfortable with or already have in the laboratory. All right. Uh, do you have to be a COIS member to purchase a COIS analyzer? Not at all. No, no. you can purchase them, both of those either through Panadent, who sells the actual COIS analyzer, or AD2, who sells a, I don't want to call it an aqua version, but another version of the facial analyzer. So there's two companies out there that sell them, and they're they're both fabulous. All right, uh, you kind of you kind of answered this question, but you know they're talking about the arc or closure. Do you use need a Facebook type instrument? And I think that you kind of mentioned that and described it um, when you answered the last question. You technically need a, a semi-adjustable articulator for the proper arc of closure, but but to be honest, Jim, and I think everybody should be aware, is every case in my laboratory on a semi-adjustable articulator? No, I use the little plastic articulators too, especially for triple trays, and sometimes I even use a little metal articulator. The key is, is knowing the difference of when, where, and why, being able to work those models through your hands to understand the movements and the wear for sets that are taking place to manage the radial distance of the articulator. All right, another question, with that implant case, uh, when an implant is involved, uh, do you reduce the occlusion a little bit more over the implant? Uh, or how do, you, how do you address implant natural yes. tooth? I think the, 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 the challenge here is what we're taught how to do things and, and what we're doing sometimes isn't always the right way. And what I mean by that is when we talk about implants, and again, that was an old case, right? Would I do that exactly the same way today? No, I, I hope I evolved. If I didn't, then I'm doing something wrong. Um, the concept of removing a tooth from its, its periodontal ligament in the bone putting a rigid implant in there that is now braced in bone and has no more shock absorber or no more ability to move, and then putting something very hard on top of it doesn't really make any sense to me. Also, do I, would I want that to be an inclusion? Of course I do, because if it's not an inclusion, what could happen? The opposing dentation can now start to super up into the position or it could help add in movement. So I want it to function like a normal tooth, I think the argument that I make, and I've had this with several implant instructors over the years that, that have told me, well, implants aren't teeth. And I say, yes, they are. 
they're supposed to be teeth. This, we're supposed to restore them like teeth. We're supposed to make them look like teeth. The challenge is make sure you understand what materials to use and how to balance the occlusion to protect the implant because that's our main goal. And uh, follow up a question. Is there additional uh, reading material that someone can read up on all the things that you've uh, talked about or any of your favorite I wish, books? I wish there was. There's nothing specific. I mean, I have a book in the work for the last four years now, and hopefully one of these days I'll get it out there. But um, there are so many great books out there that I've read over the years. Fortiani has two or three that are fabulous. Um, you know, when they, they go through occlusal concepts, um, I think, um, you know, when I'm talking about bonding, I'm, I always go straight to Pascal and, and, and those books. But there's lots of different ones. I wish it was one specific that said, I could tell you it was great for this one. And maybe one day mine will finally get out and you can get that one. <laughs> we'll see. That would be nice. Uh, in a constructive envelope, are there any materials that work better than other, you know, to, to maybe help abrade against the natural teeth much better or, or you need to go stiffer material? So I think that's a, a good question, actually, right? So it's a constricted envelope, so to be clear. So when the, when the envelope is constricted, the goal is to relieve the constriction. It's not about the material. It's about getting it away from the constriction. But... Let's be honest, if I put um, zirconia, which is a, a very rigid, hard material, and that's what's opposing natural dentition, and I haven't fixed the constriction, will I break the zirconia? Probably not. Will I wear the opposing dentition? Yes. And that's problematic for me. So what would I rather there? A softer material. Maybe I want to layer on the zirconia, so I have felt static against the natural teeth. Um, Will the felt fabric wear the teeth? Yeah, it could too, but it just won't wear it at the same rate that a much harder material would wear it at. So uh, I'm always trying to look at the long-term effect of, of when to layer, when not to layer, when to stay monolithic, when not to stay. All right, great. All right, a couple more questions. If you do have any uh, additional questions, please send them through the uh, question box. But um, the question about, you you talked about the one to three ratio. Can you ex further expand on that what that means yeah so, yeah, so um when i showed you the molar slide of of the radial distance right and i said that on an articulator a little plastic articulator the center of rotation is here and the tooth is here but in the mouth or on a real articulator the center of rotation moves further away they call that radial distance that's the distance between the rotation of the center and how far away the tooth is the further away you go from the tooth, the further and further, I'm sorry, the further away you go from the center, the less force that's applied in, in a class two lever system. And it's funny because I was working on this late last night as usual, Jim, and I started to put a whole bunch of lever system stuff in there and I, I threw it all out. I'm like, no, this is just getting too complicated now and I'm gonna <laughs> confuse you. So I don't wanna confuse you now. I'm just gonna say simplicity. The further away you go from the rotational center, the bigger the arc becomes, right? I'll just kind of show you. If I'm here and here and I make a circle from here to here, that's the size of the circle. If I go here, the circle has to be much bigger to get there. That's the radial distance, the further away you go. So what that means is, if I open the anterior teeth one millimeter, by the time I move that back to the second molar, that one millimeter is no longer one millimeter. It's only about three quarters of a millimeter now because it's based on the center of rotation. So the way to look at this is, if you open up a vertical three millimeters in the incisal edge position, you've really only opened up one millimeter on the second molar. Yeah, it, the, the subject matter is really great, and this is, uh, you know, it, it's very heavy, right? It's very, it's, it's a large it's uh, so amount of information, that. yeah, that you're trying to skinny down into, uh, uh, you know, the fundamentals of it. All right, uh, last question, uh, the home concept. Does the patient clench down to create that position? You, ha you showed the two slides next to each other. One yeah. was slightly open, then it was closed, so. So, so the home, home concept is probably the toughest concept to really grab onto. I would argue it's the most important concept of inclusion today. And, and I think the, re the relating factor to that is for us in the laboratory 
think about how many crowns over the years you've made as pretty as you can, polished it up, sent it out the door, and then it comes back to you, grounds flat, and the doctor says, glaze and polish, right? And you look at that and you say, but I don't understand, it's nowhere near where it used to be. How can that be possible? That's all based on home position. So what that actually means is you have what we call an engram. The engram is whatever you do, your brain already has a memory of it. The example I've always used over the years is stairs. When you walk up one, two, three stairs, your brain has the memory of how each, each foot has moved up and down those stairs and you no longer think the rest of the way up the stairs. You actually just run up there and it's kind of easy for you. But if one stair is off by one micron, just a hair, that's when you trip. That's when you fumble up the stairs because the engram has just changed. And that's the way occlusion kind of works. Um, basically, my, my lower jaw closes, I hit one little spot. My brain knows I'm home, and then the rest of it takes over through mastication, meaning that now I close the rest of the way. I might squeeze down the teeth and move the pedagogidontal ligament. I might slide forward or back a little bit to lock into the most MIP position. Uh, and each of those is kind of important. So I always want to know the home point of my patients and how they close before we just start, you know, waxing and opening verticals and changing. Because I don't want to lose the home reference. All right. So we got a last minute uh, question in on a case where there are uh, we were restoring a large number of anteriors. How do you establish a proper envelope of function? When you say a large number of anteriors, you, you know there are only twelve of those, right? So how large can it be? It be <laughs> so. I just read it verbatim. So. <laughs> Let's say I'll say how large lower, can it be, upper, right? lower. <laughs> you're six of six. Um, say it again. So when you're when you're restoring a large a large number, I'm just laughing. Yeah, at let's, let's uh, uh, rephrase it on a, on a case where we are restoring the anteriors, all anteriors, uh, or partial. How do you establish a proper envelope of function? Is, is that so, just a normal over jet over bite? Yeah. So so that's what I was trying to figure out what they meant by that. So realistically. Part of it has to do with tooth position. If the teeth are all flared out, upper and lower teeth are flared out already, and you have to restore them, you only have the two options. That's what I tried to make clear in, in the front, the, those first few slides, right? What are my options? I either have to move the teeth out of the way, and that's orthodontic position, or I have to change the vertical dimension. Problem is, is if I'm only restoring the anterior teeth, all of them, um, I'm not changing the vertical dimension. There is no way. So what's my other only other option is either now aggressive prepping the teeth to get them out of the way or orthodontics or moving the teeth before I restore them. And, and I think this is what I kind of wanted you to see in those slides where I said you have to learn to see and read and be a little bit adamant about what you can and can't do. So the simple answer to your question is can you work through the envelope properly? When you're only working with the anterior teeth, not all the time. Sometimes you're limited to the, the jaw position, the tooth position, uh, and the amount of space you have to work in. And I would rather you see this as an orthodontic solution um, or possibly even more restorative and, and an OBD solution. But those are the, the, the ways you look at it, right? Rule one, where is the incised electric position belong in the face? Rule two, what is the occlusal plane that I need? And then rule three is, what is the envelope? Where will those teeth work behind there? And, and that's what I want to establish if I'm using vertical dimension as my safety net or um, orthodontics as my safety net or preparation as the last option, aggressive preparation to move the teeth out of the way, which I'm not a fan of. It could be another uh, webinar topic, the three rules of anteriors. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> Um, all right, Peter, greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I know you're a busy, busy person uh, doing everything that you do, and we love the education that you provide all of us. I like this uh, topic, this subject matter. It was really good. Um, so we'll be uh, concluding the webinar. Any last uh, thoughts to everyone? No, it's just, it's a tough one, right? I, I struggled with it all night trying to figure out how to simplify it as best I can. I don't know if I did the greatest job with it. I hope you got a few key points out of it. And that's really just managing 
thinking about the envelope, thinking about the tooth position, thinking about the vertical dimensions, especially when you're working through larger cases. And, and, and for me, I, I spend most of my day with larger cases, uh, although I think I have three single centrals on my desk right now instead today. But um, I, I just want you to think, right? I want you to be able to kind of work your way through the cases and think through them and not just go to the solution of what's the hardest material to get this done the quickest way because uh, that's not our future. Our future is about being able to think through the processes and work better with our, our clinical partners. All right. Well, thank you again, and thank you the audience for joining us today. Uh, greatly appreciate your attendance. Uh, send us in some uh, questions or, uh, you know, we can do some follow-up. The information for Peter's on the screen. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you everyone for joining us. This will conclude today's webinar with Mr. Peter Peasy. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody. Take care.